All right, welcome back into sunny Los Angeles, California. I'm Bill Ryder, and this is Ryder's Block, presented by Stefan versus the Game on Facebook. Watch, we got a huge couple beatdowns in the NBA. David Cohn, the Cy Young Award winner and many-time World Series champion, is going to be on the show to talk about the Yankees and his new book. And we'll go inside the numbers on a critical matchup tonight. That and more begins right now. Under intense pressure and on very different ends of the spectrum in terms of what they had at stake, both Toronto and Denver decimate their opponents at home to take fairly commanding 3-2 series leads. Toronto ameliorated Philly 125-89. to That's an actual score. Denver over Portland 124-98. to And it's interesting because both of those teams and organizations in very different places. For Denver, a youth movement that seems to be achieving more than we expected earlier than we thought that they would. And for Toronto, a massive, massive gamble on Kawhi Leonard and what the future holds, which we'll get into. Certainly winning games, winning this series, a big part from Asai Ujiri, the president of basketball operations, north of the border in making that gamble paid off. But the other interesting thing about that game is not just taking the 3-2 series lead and not just being one home win, if that's necessary in a game seven, there's still game six on the road for each team, one home win away from the conference finals, but the fact that they humiliated their opponents and that psychological impact, that psychological effect of trying to convince the guy on the other side of the equation that they simply can't beat you. And while Philly's not going to concede anything, at least not out loud. And while Portland's not going to concede anything, at least not out loud, those kinds of defeats at this kind of point in the season in the playoffs, they can be very significant. And certainly Brett Brown, the head coach of the Sixers, after the game could not shy away from the fact he and his guys and his team, they got owned. It's punishing. When we go back and you look at the game, if you just sort of go straight to transition defense and turnovers... And then you look at what 31 points off turnovers. <coughs> that is uh, that is haunting. You you cannot win with those types of numbers. Someone get Brett Brown a lozenge and go find Ben Simmons. All right, we're gonna get to that series in a second. I, I want to start with Toronto and the fact that the Raptors, not for the first time, but for one of the first times in this postseason, gave Kawhi Leonard all the help he needed and a lot more. Last night in that game, six players for Toronto, including Kawhi, six players were in double digits in terms of scoring. That's the first time that's happened in this postseason. And this is important too, that defense for the Raptors is a big part of what they do well. Not just Kawhi. We know Kawhi is an incredible player. He's the best two-way player in the game. He's probably the best defensive player in the game of basketball, certainly at the wing at his position. But his entire team rallied around that level of defense. And they've done that a lot this, this postseason. Toronto's held opponents this season to fewer than 100 points in eight of their 10 games. Both times that they've given up 100 points or more, they've lost those games. And last night was the first time they've held Philly to fewer than 90 points a big part of the reason Toronto got it done. The scoring significant. Sure, they beat them badly on the offensive end. They also beat them in a big way on the defensive end. And this is the, uh, the thing about this team. Speaking of Kawhi, he's good enough, at least at this stage, to carry your team without help to a postseason victory, maybe a series victory. And while he got help last night, it's not like he needed it. Kawhi was still amazing. In this series, by the way, 31 points per game, eight rebounds per game, three and a half assists. The dude is shooting 57% from the field, a little bit better, and 47% from three. And what's scary for anyone going up against him and for the Raptors with the notion he could leave, Kawhi the alien, we'll call him around the office, gets better in the postseason every year. 2016 playoffs, 27-6. 27 and 6, 60% true shooting percentage. In the 2017 postseason, 28, 8, 67% true shooting percentage. And in this postseason, 31 and the 8 we told you about, 69% true shooting percentage. The reality is 
that if Kawhi Leonard doesn't get help, they're going to be competitive in a series because he's going to be potentially, I'd even say likely, the best player on the floor any given night, regardless what team, West or East, that they're going up against. Here's another interesting thing about these teams before we move on to some other thoughts and the disappearing act of Ben Simmons. The comp for these guys is really interesting. The Sixers starting five, their average draft pick slot is 13, 12.8. The Raptors starting five, their average draft pick spot is in the second round, 32. Masai Ujiri, who's the president of operations, maybe he came up with a different process and they did in Philly, or maybe Philly and Elton Brand just destroyed the process when they let Sam Hinkie go and those decision makers, the few since then, the two who have dismantled it. But Ben Simmons was part of that process, and he has been a part of this disappearing act. As much as Kawhi got help, Philly's not getting what it needs consistently enough from the people that they need it from. Embiid has not been great every night. He needs to be. And Simmons has just been bad most nights. Ben Simmons, and I love his game, but we know the guy can't shoot. And he didn't play well in the playoffs last year. Just five shots, five in that game last night. He had more turnovers and assists, five to four. And this series, he's averaging nine and a half points, basically nine, seven, and let's be generous, five in the regular season. Nine, seven, and five was actually 17, nine, and eight. What a really inopportune time for Ben Simmons to vanish. If he's not good enough, they can't get it done. And for Philly, the future's, I think, fairly bright. Embiid should be there. Simmons should be there, assuming Embiid is healthy. I don't think Jimmy Butler's going to be in Philly, but you never know. If he's not, Tobias Harris is going to be there. Philly's got some years ahead of them. For Toronto, the stakes are much higher. Kawhi Leonard's a one-year rental. The Raptors and Masai Ujiri gave away the greatest Raptor of all time. Whatever they did or didn't accomplish in the playoffs, that's what DeMar DeRozan was on the floor in the heart and soul of that locker room. And they have to, not, not need to, have to win this series and probably the next series to have a chance to convince Kawhi Leonard to stick around. And in the face of that pressure and knowing that that's what's at stake, it was Toronto who showed up and Philly who did not. For, for Denver, it's a little bit different. It's a story of youth, and youth utterly and totally prevailing. Interestingly, this is the youngest team, or excuse me, the second youngest team in this post in the NBA this year. It's the eighth youngest team in the history of the playoffs. Those teams are supposed to shrink from the moment. They're supposed to fade in the face of a guy like Damian Lillard. Someone like Nikola Jokic isn't supposed to be the star at this moment that he's been. And one of the reasons might be a secret weapon. Paul Millsap has been a huge part. He's been a cornerstone to what they've done on the floor and what they've done in the locker room. Millsap, who's 34 years old, 24, eight and two last night, obviously a huge night in Denver's own domination over Portland. He's averaging 19 and 10 in this postseason, and his playoff experience is unprecedented. Game six will be his 100th playoff game. He's been to the playoffs 77% of his 13 year career. It's unprecedented in that Denver locker room. And it's something, what he means to the team that Gary Harris hit on after Denver took that 3-2 series lead? Uh, Sal's been huge for us. Um, he has the most playoff experience on the team, and um, he's been that calming factor. Uh, he's been huge for us this series. Um, he's been bringing it offensively, defensively, and uh, he helped us get off to a great start today, and uh, we have to, you know, follow him up. It's the anti-Kyrie effect we talked about yesterday. Sometimes a good player, but not your star, who's an amazing locker room guy and a great presence, can make up for some shortcomings. And youth, at this stage of the NBA season, usually a shortcoming. That's the secret weapon. On to the not-so-secret weapon, not anymore. Nikola Jokic continues to look like it, not just an MVP candidate, but a top-five player in the years ahead. Consider just what he's done so far in this postseason. Last night he was 25, 19, and 6. He's the first player since LeBron, who did it in 2010, to average 25, 19, and 6 in a playoff game. In this series, these numbers are ridiculous. In this, this series, Jokic is averaging 26, 14 and a half, almost nine assists, one and a half steals, 53% from the field, and holy cow, 47% from the three-point line this postseason, and you can see it there, 24 and a half, 13 and nine. The big O, Oscar Robertson, is the only player in NBA history to average 24, 13 and nine in a single postseason. And I just want to do this comp for you, right? So this postseason, we're looking at Jokic at 24 and a half, 13 and nine. In this series, 26 and a half, 15, nine, one and a half, 53 percent, 47 percent. That's not as good. But the greatest postseason performance I've ever seen, and I covered it, was LeBron in 2015 when Cleveland lost to the Warriors that first time in the finals, but 
LeBron should have been the Finals MVP anyway. LeBron was 36, obviously more than Jokic. 13, exact same assists per game, 8.8. 1.3 steals fewer. 40% from the field, less. 21% on threes. Obviously not good. I'm not saying Jokic is LeBron. I am saying we might want to start talking about him in that context. He's been utterly and totally incredible. Now, there's also been, and it's cost me a lot of money on the gambling side. I side. I gotta stop betting on Portland. There's been a disappearing act in this Portland series, the way there has been in this Philly series. And that's Damian Lillard, who has just not been the force. I keep waiting, I keep betting on and losing. The idea, the notion, I guess it's a belief, though it's waning, that Damian Lillard's going to show up and he's going to win a game single-handedly. In this series, Lillard's averaging 26 points per game on just 42% shooting from the field and 25%, yikes, from the three-point line. That compares to 33, 46%, and nearly twice as good, 48% from the three-point line. It's been ugly. Now, Mike Malone, the coach in Denver, is saying the same sort of stuff I've been saying when I'm betting, and that is, man, you know eventually Dame is capable of getting red hot. He's missed some open shots, but I think you have to give our defense some credit. After nine games, regular season and playoffs, the fact that we've defended him at the level we've defended him at. I'll say this once again, though, uh, because he's a great player. He's an all-star for a reason. Um, he's capable of scoring 50 in game six, and we're well aware of that. All right, so Portland fans, you got to take a lesson from the Eastern Conference. Disappearing acts equal being Philly, and a one-man wrecking crew until your team shows up can equal being Toronto. Damian Lillard has to go full Kawhi, at least on the offensive end. If Lillard, especially when you're going up against a guy like Jokic who's putting up near LeBron slash Oscar Robertson numbers, if Lillard can't be the best player on the floor the next two games, it's the Denver Nuggets who are advancing, and it's associate producer slash PA David here on the show who's rubbing all of our faces in the fact that he called it when the rest of us doubted his team. This is Riders Block. I'm Bill Ryder. Show brought to you by Stefan versus the game on Facebook Watch. And we are going to talk a little baseball with David Cohn. The dude won a Cy Young. He threw a perfect game. He won who's counting five World Series. He's got a new book out. And we're going to talk some Major League Baseball with him in just a moment on CBS Sports HQ. Bill Ryder with you here on Ryder's Block, presented by Stefan versus the Game on Facebook. Watch David Cohn, really, really remarkable guy, really successful pitcher. You know the story, five-time World Series champion, won a Cy Young, all that good stuff. I had the chance to visit with David earlier, really enjoyed our conversation. Here it is. David Cohn, uh, five-time World Series champion, Cy Young Award winner. Thanks for uh, author. I, I can't forget author of Full Count, The Education of a Pitcher, which, by the way... I'm reading and enjoying. What's going on, man? Not a lot. Thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate you you taking the book and helping me out with it. Yeah, it's really, it's actually, it's really good. I got, I just got to the part about the song "Pressure" and how that sort of resonated with you in, in Toronto. And even though it's not the same thing, that song resonated with me when I first got into television. You know, since I have a face for radio, so I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I know, I know how that goes. I want to I want to ask you about the book and the Yankees, but you know some breaking news last night. Mike Fires gets his second career no hitter. You've thrown a perfect game. Can you just take us inside that moment when you get that last out and that baby's in the history books? Yeah, you know I still remember the uh, adrenaline rush I got walking out to warm up for the ninth inning, and, and there's no feeling quite like that. Uh, the anticipation of the moment. The crowd reaction, especially uh, in New York with, with the Yankee fans that day when I threw mine back 20 years ago now in 1999. So I, I certainly could feel for uh, Mike Fires last night as I watched him pitch that ninth inning. And I was really impressed with his demeanor and his calmness throughout throughout the whole situation. I, I felt like my head was on fire in the ninth inning during my game. So I, I know underneath that that heartbeat was racing and it's really tough to control your emotions in that situation. David, your, your your catcher, any of your teammates, does anyone at a certain point say, go get this baby, or do they really pretend it's just a normal moment? I think for the most part, it's, the superstitions are still very true in today's game, and nobody wants to be blamed for being a jinx, uh, even as silly as that sounds. And I, I was not a superstitious guy. Uh, I, I didn't really even think about it, but nobody wanted to talk to me, and I'm quite sure. 
sure that uh, nobody wanted to talk to Mike Myers last night either. And uh, if there was anything said to him at all, well, it had nothing with the word no, no, or nothing with the word of, uh, you know, don't, you know, don't mess this up. I love, I love the superstitions in baseball. So I'm reading the book. It's great. What are people going to learn about David Cohn? They didn't know. Maybe what did you remember about yourself that you'd forgotten as you excavated your career in your life? Well, you know, I think, you know, with the help of Jack Curry, who's a great writer, you know, his resume speaks for itself. He's a New York Times columnist for 15 plus years covering the Yankees and, and, and all over baseball, really, for that matter. And we wanted to be refreshingly honest with my take. It wasn't just all about advice or stories about the good times. You know, we touch on some of the bad times, a lot of the mistakes that I've made, really going back to childhood and my minor league days and it was, it's really an honest journey, I think, that, that tells you the story of, of uh, how a pitcher became educated, and it covers everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, and then uh, of the vulnerableness of a pitcher at times, and you know uh, how reactionary a, a pitcher can be on a bad day, and how a pitcher-catcher relationship can really help out when a pitcher gets in, under duress or when he kind of loses his mind sometimes on the mound, which certainly happened to me a few times in my career. Yeah, it's, it's refreshingly candid, full count, the education of a pitcher. It's really, really good. David, you're also, you've got so many hats. You're also a broadcaster for the Yes Network, which broadcasts Yankees games. And I want to ask you about this team. You talk about superstitions and, and luck. They've been snake bit with injuries, and they're still playing really good baseball. And you're watching up close. How are the Yankees winning this many baseball games with so many guys on the I.L.? It is truly remarkable. I mean, nobody could have predicted this, and nobody saw any of these performances coming from anywhere. Uh, you know, Gio Urshela has just been uh, unbelievable uh, at, at third base, and he was probably going to be in AAA for the majority of the year. He was a complete uh, depth piece for, for Brian Cashman, the GM of the Yankees. So to see what he's done, kind of his second go-round, has been a huge lift for the team. And I, I, I've been around teams where that really they really feed off of each other. When you see somebody like a Gio Urshela or a Cameron Mybin, uh, they, they came in off the trade wire that's get a second uh, life with the Yankees. Uh, Luke Voigt, who came in last year with such a bang and continues again this year to be kind of their best player, their best offensive weapon. Uh, these are all new names for the, this Yankee fan base. And I think in a lot of ways – it's taken some of the pressure off the Yankees. There was high expectations coming into this year. And with all the injuries, the fan base has kind of taken a step back and really enjoyed the ride with a lot of these no-name characters, the replacement players, as, as they say, or the next man up. And it's really been refreshing, I think, for the Yankee fan base to, to watch these young players really contribute. Yeah, it's, I mean, Void, if, if I remember correctly, it wasn't a guarantee out of spring training. He was even going to win the position. He was in a in a battle, and you said it, he might be the best position player on this team right now. It's so true. Uh, nothing was promised to him, even off of last year when he was so good for the Yankees down the stretch. It was, it was almost this sense of, uh, can we believe what we see? Is he for real? And so you're right. In spring training, he still had to battle Greg Bird for the first base job, and Greg Bird had a pretty good spring training, so Luke Voigt had to match him the whole way. He's constantly in a position to have to prove himself, even to today, even though I think the, the fan base in the organization really believes in Luke Voigt at this point. But nonetheless, I think he probably feels he still needs to prove himself on a daily basis. And, and to, to watch that excitement, you know, that enthusiasm that you see from a lot of these young players as they're establishing themselves or they're getting the second chance, boy, you just see the smiles on their face faces and, and you see the reaction of the Yankee fan base to them. Boy, it, it is something to watch. It, it's Totally unexpected, but very refreshing. And, and David, as you know, the, the pitching staff has performed admirably. They're in the top in the game, I think five or six in earned run average right now as, as a staff. But Luis Severino still out. Feels like he keeps getting pushed back. He is the ace of this ball club. They'd obviously like him back a, at some point. What's your concern level with where he's at? And, and what's the what's the reality for him over the next few months? Well, my concern is, is that... Uh, they didn't really know what was wrong with him right away. It was initially diagnosed as a rotator cuff strain, and then we came to find out that he actually had a tear in his lap muscle, which is uh, something that's over easily overcomable, but it takes a lot of time. I mean, you really have to completely shut it down to allow that tear in the lap muscle to heal. And then you're starting from square one to kind of build back up in a throwing program, a full spring training. So 
there's no telling when he will be back at some point after the All-Star break. I think at this point, you're just not sure what you're going to get out of Luis Severino this year. And if you get a lift from him in the second half of the year at some point, uh, that would be a big plus for the Yankees. But when you see a guy like Domingo Herman almost step into his place and have the type of success he's had right now, it, it's almost as if they had an in-house replacement that's putting up Severino-like numbers, which is a, a huge story, I think. Domingo Herman uh, deserves a lot of credit, and I, I don't think we've talked about him quite enough. David, it's interesting. Obviously, the Red Sox are the team, if you're a Yankees fan, you're keeping your eye on. But the Rays right now have not just the best record in baseball. If you go back to August of last year, they were really strong at the finish of last season. So that sample size suggests they're, they're legit. Around that Yankees organization, are, are, are folks eyeing the Rays as seriously as they do the Red Sox? Or are the Red Sox still feel like the challenger in that division for the Yanks? Well, you can kind of see the Red Sox catching up, getting closer to 500 over the last 10 days or so. So you know they're still lurking, and they're still a very dangerous team and somebody you need to keep an eye on, without a doubt. And by the end of the day, I think the Red Sox will be right in the thick of the race. But with all that being said, the Rays are definitely for real. They are a team that, as you said, and rightly so, if you take away their slow start from last year, I think they were 10 games under 500 about this point last year. Uh, and from that point on to this year, they're one of the best records in the major leagues overall over a course of a full season. So yeah, I think the Rays are positioned to, to sustain this run that they're having. They have a lot of talent in their lineup, a lot of talent on the mound. Blake Snell is as good as any left-hander in the game right now. They also have a farm system that's still highly rated. They have a lot of prospects that are ready to come up and make a push and help uh, sustain whatever momentum they have. So, yeah, I watch the Rays every day. I know they're for real. Uh, I, I watch their games on a nightly basis because they are an interesting team right now. When you consider the payroll that they have, I think the Yankees have more payroll on the injured reserve list than the Rays have in their, in their everyday lineup right now or on their roster. So they are a remarkable team right now. They have the right mix of young pitching and, and young position players and then a farm system to sustain that. So watch out for the Rays. David Cohn, uh, really enjoying the book. Go out and get it. Let me hold it up properly here with my camera skills. Uh, it's you're right, and you said it. It's really uh, it's really genuine. It's really honest. So for baseball fans, absolutely check it out. I I really enjoyed the conversation. We, we'd love to do it again. Thanks for thanks for making time for us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks thanks for showing the book. All right, from one great pitcher to another, thank you to David Cohn. And speaking of Mike Fires and that no-hitter, we're going to go inside the numbers on that historic accomplishment when we come back to the program in just a second. Now ready, here's the turn, the kick, and the 2-2 delivery is swung on and missed on a breaking ball in the dirt. And a lot of green and gold. Racing out from the third base dugout surrounding right hander Mike Fires, who has indeed thrown an Oakland Athletics no hitter tonight. All right, cool moment. Mike Fires, the no hitter. We talked to David Cohn about what it feels like. Let's go inside the numbers and see what the data tell us on Fires' no hitter. We start with the number 35. In firing, get it, firing that no-hitter, Fires became the 35th pitcher in MLB history to throw multiple no-hitters in his career. 64 is next up. Coming into last night, Fires had an ERA plus of 64. That was the last among starting pitchers in all of Major League Baseball, making that a very improbable no-hitter. How about number 11? This was the 11th no-hitter in the history of Oakland, Alameda County Coliseum. That is tied for the third most of any stadium in the majors behind Dodger Stadium. They have 12 and Fenway Park at 14. 130 is next. Only 11 times has a pitcher thrown 130 pitches or more in a no-hitter. The last two pitchers to achieve that feat was Mike Fires. And finally, 37. This is the 37th no-hitter since 2010, most among any decade in baseball history. Mike Fires getting it done. Me, Bill Ryder, not getting it done. It's Bill's uh, big bet of the day. Those are boos, and they should be, because I have been on a bit of a cold streak, 14 and 13, clinging to 500. You might want to fade me here. I'm utterly avoiding Milwaukee minus 8.5. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going to rally cap this thing. I'm going to do the opposite of what I normally do. Don't ever bet on James Harden's my rule. I'm going to break my rule to try to turn this thing around. 
Give me Houston plus six. It just feels like a close game. I'm taking the Rockets, and we appreciate you here on CBS Sports HQ's Riders Block, which, by the way, is brought to you by Stefan versus the game on Facebook. Watch. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for being here. We will see you tomorrow. The folks down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, are taking over right now.